I think that the Italian aspect played a role in her story. But it certainly played a role in why I decided to write this book. There were three, four connections that I had with Eugenia that, that propelled me to write the story. The first is the Italian connection. The second is the senior Crown Prosecutor. Prosecuted her, and I'm the senior Crown Prosecutor. The third was the death of Annie took place in the Lane Cove River Park. And when I was a boy, I lived within a few hundred metres of the Lane Cove River Park. So I know that park extremely well. And the fourth connection was that her trial took place in what was and still is called the Central Criminal Court. It's court number five at Darlinghurst. And I've prosecuted many trials there myself. So, and it's virtually the same as it's always been. So, I mean, with all of those connections, it's hardly surprising that I've decided to, to write this book. I don't think there's another legal story like it. I've been looking around for something that has as, as much interest and, and dynamics and the personal story and the legal story, it's just, I think it's unique. This is Eugenia. Eugenia was born in Livorno in 1875. At the age of two, her parents migrated to New Zealand. Why? There was an agent of the New Zealand government in Livorno specifically recruiting Italians to come and work on the Italian railways and roads to build the infrastructure. So there were, there were large groups of Livornese who came and settled predominantly in Wellington. Most of them only lasted a few weeks working on the roads or the railways and ended up doing other things. And Eugenia's father was also one of those. He became a carrier and a fisherman. Eugenia, at a fairly young age, realised that there was something different about her. She realised at a fairly early age, probably in her early teens, that she was a male locked in the body of a female. So whereas her body was a female body, she felt deep inside herself with the utmost conviction that she was a male. It's a condition which we know as transsexualism today. Now, can you imagine what it was like in the 1890s being in a, in a conservative Italian family with a very conservative Italian father, being his firstborn daughter and thinking that you're a male? So she had a terrible time in New Zealand. And eventually, at the age of 18, she decided to escape all of that, and she enrolled as a male seaman called Eugene Fellini on a ship as a seaman. For over two years, she carried off being a seaman on this ship, was living with her fellow seamen, swearing, working, drinking, and was just accepted as one of the men. Until a fateful day when there was an Italian captain on this ship and she made a mistake of language that you could only make in Italian where you have gender endings. And the captain realised her true identity as a biological female and she was viciously raped. She ended up in Sydney. She was offloaded in Newcastle, ended up in Sydney, pregnant, had a baby in Sydney and she found an Italian family that was childless, that was willing to take on this child. So this, this child, it was a daughter called Josephine, and Eugenia then adopted the identity of a male by the name of Harry Crawford. And for the next 22 years, Harry lived life as a working class man in Western Sydney, very, very successfully. He was working as a labourer, working as, um, as a horseman, looking after horses and carts, working as a rouseabout in pubs. Uh, he worked at the Peridrow Rubber Company, which is now Birkenhead Point, which is partially still there. Um, and uh, at one stage, he worked for a doctor in uh, Burunga, looking after his horses and cart and driving the horses and cart. And also working for the doctor as a housekeeper was a very beautiful widow by the name of Annie Burkett. And they fell in love. Annie Burkett uh, 
her first husband had died. She had a son who was 10. And eventually, after a long time of wooing Annie, she agreed to marry Harry. And they were legally married by a, a minister, a Methodist minister in, uh, in Balmain. And they had a, a fairly normal, average married life for over three years without Annie realising anything about the biological identity <laughs> of her husband. Um, now, I'm sure there's an obvious question there that <laughs> you would like me to address. <laughs> um, perhaps I'll come back to that. <laughs> and tell you this, that after three years, for reasons that are, I explore in the book, Annie found out the true identity of her husband. They lived in a sort of limbo situation for about eight months when they went for a picnic to the Lane Cove River Park. And Harry came back from that picnic and Annie didn't. Three years later, Harry was charged with the murder of Annie. And at the trial, it was alleged that Harry had used a device, a dildo, to pleasure not just this wife, but another wife that he'd subsequently married called Lizzie. Because after Annie disappeared, about a year later, he married Lizzie. Now, at the trial, the prosecutor produced what was said to be the article. That's, that's the only name that was used in court. <laughs> the article. But the prosecutor, who was one of my predecessors, William Coyle KC, waved it around in front of the jury to such an extent that they would have been mesmerised like a cobra being mesmerised by its keeper. <laughs> and the Justice and Police Museum in Sydney, in Phillips Street, have an item which is said to be the article from the trial. But let me tell you, I, I have inspected it <laughs> and I'm utterly convinced that it's not the real item and the curator of the museum is equally convinced that it's not the real item. And the reason why, well there are a few reasons why. The first and most important reason why is that it's about that long. <laughs> Um, it also it doesn't match the description that was given in the trial. I think somebody has wanted to souvenir the real item and they've put something like a draft excluder in to substitute it, <laughs> something like that. But anyway, um, be that as it may, there are these two wives that Harry Crawford <coughs> managed to convince for years at a time that he was a genuine male. All of his workmates, he was very popular with his workmates, he used to be a very tough wiry, hard worker. He was very successful in, create, in, in, in maintaining this character of Harry Crawford for 22 years. And the first part of the book is about those 22 years and, and, and the period before and how he managed to do that. Now then came the time when he was working as a rouseabout in a hotel that's still there it's called the Empire Hotel in Annandale. It's not far from here. It's on Parramatta Road. He was working there one day and two police came and said, we're investigating the death of Annie Burkett. We want you to come to the Central Police Station. Now, uh, he was taken back to the police station and questioned and um, told that he was going to be charged with the murder of his first wife, Annie Burkett. And uh, Harry said to the police, what happens now? And he was told, well, you'll be taken to the Long Bay prison and you'll be, you'll be showered and you'll be given a set of jail clothes and you'll remain in the, in the prison until your trial, which will be about three months. And then and only then did Harry decide the time had come to disclose his true biological gender. And he, he said to the police, well, um, you can't do that. I want to go to the women's prison. And of course... You know, you can imagine what their reaction was. Well, you know, I wouldn't mind going to the women's prison too. But anyway, um, he disclosed his true identity. And this photograph was taken by a police photographer on that very day after he'd been charged, after he had disclosed his identity as Eugenia Fellini. Mm. 
And you can imagine that after 22 years, this is the very first time that Harry Crawford's identity has come unstuck. And you can see, I think, the look of impending tragedy, uh, a look of, of doom, a, a look of, uh, that you know, the, the world as he knew it had come to an end. And then Harry had a trial. And as I mentioned, the trial was prosecuted by my predecessor, William Coyle Casey, who was a fantastic advocate. He was so fantastic that before he became the senior Crown Prosecutor for New South Wales, his, name, his nickname when he was at the private bar was The Bulldog. <laughs> so he was tough. Eugenia, was, uh, Eugenia qualified for legal aid. And the Legal Aid Commission found a barrister for her who was probably quite cheap. His, he only came to the law very late in the piece, in his early 40s. He'd been a farmer before that, and his nickname when he was a farmer was Silent Mac. <laughs> so Silent Mac versus the Bulldog. <laughs> you can imagine what sort of a, a fight it was. It was a mis mismatched <coughs> fight. It was like putting a, a heavyweight boxer against a super lightweight. And when I read the transcript of the trial, as I was turning every page, I was, I was shaking my head and thinking, how could he have done that? How could he have made that mistake? And he made so many egregious mistakes and that there were a lot of good points that he could have made that he didn't make. And of course, the prosecutor took advantage of every mistake that he made. And you can hardly blame him for that. Um, the, the jury of 12 that decided Eugenia's case, of course, was only men. You might be interested to know it was only in 1946 that the state of New South Wales allowed women to serve on juries. Can you believe that? <laughs> anyway, by the time it came for the trial, there'd been a tremendous amount of publicity in the newspapers about Eugenia's arrest and her charging. And the newspapers treated her mercilessly. They treated her as a freak of nature, as a pervert, as a threat to the moral fabric of society. It was as though, having crossed that gender divide from female to male, she'd committed a crime far worse than the murder that she was charged with. I mean, it just struck at, at, at everything that was important about society. So by the time it came for her trial, the jury, the members of the jury would have been subjected to all of this prejudicial pre-trial publicity. So it was very hard for her to get a fair trial. For reasons that I explain in the book, and I, I go through the trial and point out all the, the mistakes that were made by her counsel, and all of the weird things that happened, and I, I've written it for people who have no experience of the law, so anybody should be able to understand it. I'm hoping that high school students will read it. For, for reasons that I explore in the book, I think there was a miscarriage of justice. I'd like to think that if I'd been her counsel, she would have been acquitted. <laughs> but I think if she'd had somebody who was a match for William Coyle, that she would have been acquitted. Or at the very worst, convicted of manslaughter instead of murder. Now, she was convicted of murder, and in those days there was only one sentence that was applicable for murder, and that was the death penalty. Now, um, the, one of the great ironies of Eugenia's life is that the death penalty was not imposed on her largely because she was a woman. In fact, when Eugenia was convicted and the penalty was imposed upon her by the judge, there hadn't been a woman who'd been executed in New South Wales for something like 25 or 30 years. So she was really barely at risk of it being carried out. But still, she had to wait about three months before the New South Wales government made that decision to commute her sentence to life imprisonment. She served what was at the time, the longest sentence of any female at the time in New South Wales. What happened to her in jail was absolutely fascinating. In a sense, her life in jail for 
weird reasons, was a bit easier than it had been in the general community. And I explain why. And then she was released, and I explain how and why. It took many, many years, and there was a, a pressure group that formed around her. And there were some newspapers that were for her and some newspapers that were against her. It became a, a cause celebre in New South Wales, indeed in Australia. One of the saddest parts about Eugenia's life is that when she left New Zealand, her parents had been so embarrassed by her and by what she'd got up to and what she'd tried to do that they were relieved to see her go. She left without any warning. She didn't say any goodbyes. She just disappeared. And, and they were almost relieved that she'd gone. Um, we don't know if they heard any news about her until the time of her trial, but they would certainly have heard about her arrest and trial because it was extensively publicised in New Zealand. There was not the slightest contact from any member of her family at all. And she had something like 16 brothers and sisters. Not one of them made any contact. Her parents made no contact. The circumstances of Eugenia's death are described in the book and I won't tell you about it because I want to leave it for you to read. But what is absolutely fascinating is that within a fortnight, both of her parents had died in New Zealand. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, look, that is the basic story of Eugenia, but I, I, I just want to add a little bit about the Italian connection because I think that the fact that she was born in Italy played a role in what happened to her. In New Zealand, there was a lot of prejudice against Italian migrants. In Australia at that time, and we're talking about 1878, there was a lot of prejudice against Italian migrants. When Eugenia came to Australia, she initially acknowledged her Italian background, but after a while, I mean, she, she spoke English perfectly, but her native language was Italian because her family only spoke Italian. But she could pass off as a Kiwi. Or he could pass off as a Kiwi. But eventually, what he did was he cre when he married Lizzie, he passed himself off as being a Scotsman. <laughs> now, I'm sure that the reason for that was that there was, there was a lot of prejudice against Italians. Mm. And when he came, when she came to be charged and went to trial, the fact that she was Italian was broadcast all over the place and it created a lot more prejudice against her. <coughs> there was still a lot of prejudice there. And the, to me that's amazing because she was two when she left Italy. Now, while she was in jail serving her sentence, the prosecutor, William Coyle, sent a friend of his who was a doctor, quite a prominent doctor, to visit Eugenia in jail. And I think he did this to, perhaps to try and appease his conscience or, or something like that, or maybe he was just a, a kind fellow. But he sent this doctor to visit Eugenia because this doctor spoke creditable Italian. He was an Italophile. He was, he was an Aussie, but he'd been to Italy and he'd learnt Italian. He spoke reasonably good Italian. So he went to, this doctor went twice to visit Eugenia in jail. And of course, he spoke Italian to her. She spoke English back. <laughs> but the strangest part is that this doctor offered to Eugenia to try and get her transferred to serve her sentence in Italy, thinking she's Italian, she'd much prefer to be in Italy, surely, to serve her sentence there. I mean, uh, she'd been in, in Australia and New Zealand from the age of two. What made him think that she would want to go to Italy and serve her sentence there? But what it shows is the mentality, the lack of, of understanding that somebody who'd spent almost all of their lives in Australia and New Zealand would want to go back. Yes. Um, it's 
just sheer ignorance. I mean, he totally misunderstood Eugenia. He, he wrote a chapter of a book about her. And when you read it, you, you're just horrified by all of the things that he completely misunderstood. And of course, from Eugenia's point of view, here's somebody who's coming to see her, sent by the prosecutor who's put her away. <laughs> so you can understand, she would have been a bit, a bit guarded with this man. He, did, he didn't understand that. Having said all that, if there are copies of the books out there, if you like it, I'm, I'm happy to sign them. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm also happy to answer your questions. Uh, yes, yes, uh, Annie Burkett's body. Um, Annie Burkett disappeared uh, on a Friday. It was a long. It's about a few hundred metres away. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, Annie Burkett's body. Uh, sorry, I'll go back. Annie Burkett disappeared on a Friday of a long weekend. On the Tuesday following that long weekend. A body was discovered in the park that was completely and utterly burnt beyond recognition. That body was unidentified for three years. It was only three years later that the body was identified and the police then began to investigate. What year was the trial held? Uh, it was 1940. 1940. Yeah, so it was quite early in the piece. And when did she pass away? Uh, Eugenia passed away in uh, 1938. Her trial was in 1920. She passed away in 1938. <laughs> Probably not. You know, in those days, it would have all been Anglo-Saxon names. Look, I don't know, but um, probably not. How long did it take me to write the book? Um, th what took a long time was the research. That took a long, long time. Uh, you know, on and off for about two years. The actual writing, I, I actually took 10 weeks long service leave over at the last Christmas holidays with the one before. And I, I wrote it substantially in that time. I mean, I had to do lots of revisions and additions here and additions there. But substantially, that's when I did it. Because uh, I had all the material. The actual writing part um, was probably the easiest part. And I have to say, the most enjoyable. I really loved writing it. Any other questions? Yes, very good question. I do, and it's in the book. Josephine. Josephine had a very strange upbringing because um, this Italian couple who brought her up, there'd be a man who would visit them every now and again who, um, when she was seven, her... her foster mother told her, this man is your mother. She knew her mother's true identity from the age of seven. So you can imagine what effect that would have had on a, on a young girl. She had a very torrid adolescence, eventually married a sailor who was serving on HMAS Sydney, which was the ship that was involved in the clash with the Emden, um, and had a daughter herself in 1920, 1920, when Eugenia was already in custody. She was questioned by the police, made a statement that I've got, gave evidence of the committal proceedings, and it was, it was important evidence and she hated giving it. But by the time of the trial, she made herself scarce, couldn't be found, so she was not called at the trial. Two years later, at the age of 24, she died from TB, leaving this two-year-old daughter, Rita. Now, in those days, if a mother died, the father wouldn't just automatically take over the care of the child. The chi if, unless the father remarried immediately, the child would go to a female relative. And this daughter went to a relative up on the north coast. And for reasons that I was not able to find, she ended up in an orphanage. And I've located her son, who's about my age, and interviewed him for the book. <laughs>
Uh, that's, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, she was in a women's jail. She was forced to wear the clothing that was issued by the prison, which was a kind of a loose sort of tunic sort of outfit. Um, I don't want to give too much away because it'll spoil the book, but um, in one sense, her life was easier in jail than it had been outside because there are things that can happen in jail that are just accepted that can't happen in the outside world. I think that's probably enough. Yeah, very good. <laughs>